Coming up on 2020 on ID, three young women in search of adventure. She wanted to travel and teach. And the allure of Tokyo. This is my house and I live in Japan. And she embraced it fully, she absolutely loved it. Then... And I said, I just feel something's terribly, terribly wrong. All three women murdered. You know, it's, it's the worst one any parent can get. It's horrifying to, to think that another family is facing what we had to face. And three families struggling to uncover the truth. My daughter didn't come here to be murdered. She came here to help. We were over there on our own. No embassy, no police, nothing. Can they find the killer? I was sitting eight foot away from the man who murdered my sister. And will there be justice? It's unbelievable. Nothing can prepare you. Vanish in Tokyo. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Losing a child is one of the deepest wounds a parent can suffer. Losing a child to murder is even deeper. For the three families you're about to meet, the tragedy of losing their daughters was compounded by the fact that the murder occurred on foreign soil and a very foreign culture, Japan. Who were the women associating with? And why was it so difficult for the families to get answers? First, for Lindsay Hawker, going to Tokyo was meant to be an adventure. But as Elizabeth Vargas first reported in 2008, fate would lead Lindsay into the darkest of traps. Although they live an ocean away in the English village of Warwickshire, the Hawker family may seem a lot like yours. We obviously love to spend time together. You realize what things in life are important and your love for your family and each other is definitely the most important thing. Even when we got older, we still went on holidays together, the five of us. We were always a very close family. The Hawker family had three daughters. The first to go out on her own was 21-year-old Lindsay. She was a young woman, an intelligent woman. She was going out in the world of work, and we were very proud of her. Lindsay was off to teach English in Japan. She'd chosen to experience a country steeped in tradition and, as researched by the Hawkers, a place thought to be one of the safest in the world. Going abroad on her own, she needed to be as safe as she could, really. And I think Japan was a whole different culture for her, and I think it was fulfilling a need that Lindsay had. She wanted to travel and teach. Had any of you or any member of the family ever gone to Japan? Before no. That, no. 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 I didn't really want her to go either. I was quite reluctant for her to go just because I didn't want her to leave me. <laughs> we were that close that the thought of her going away for that amount of time, I was sort of quite apprehensive. Obviously, as parents, you always have concerns for your children. We wouldn't be human if we didn't. It's just hoping that they'll be safe and that they'll be able to manage their finances and that they, you know, will be able to look after themselves, really. But the thousands of miles between them were trumped by modern technology, and Lindsay was constantly in touch. This is my house where I live in Japan. But she would either speak or text. Um, she used to email me. We heard from her almost every day. And what they heard was that Lindsay was having a ball. She wouldn't stop going on about how lovely the people were, how respectful they were, just a completely different way of life. And she embraced it fully. She absolutely loved it. Quite an adventure for her. Yeah, I realized you know, she made the right decision for herself, definitely. And I'm glad she didn't listen to me. <laughs> I wish she would have listened to you. The family's shared pleasure at Lindsay's Japanese experience came to an abrupt end on a Sunday when communication from Lindsay suddenly stopped. I emailed her and I didn't get a response. And so I texted her on her mobile phone and didn't get a response. As the day turned to evening with no word from Lindsay, the Hawker household became increasingly concerned. And I said, I just feel something's terribly, terribly wrong. I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I was up nearly all night. And the anxiety the Hawkers felt that night would only multiply the next morning. I got a phone call from her employers. 
to say that she hadn't reported for work for two days. Now, that was not like Lindsay at all. So we then contacted the embassy in Japan, and at that point she was filed as a missing person, and that was on Monday lunchtime. She, she was gone. Yeah, I remember, like, just collapsing. And I felt really upset because she was my little sister. I remember thinking, this is... I was sick, I was physically sick. I don't think any other parent or sister can understand what it was like to get news like that. It's and the worst thing what can happen to any parent. You yourself are a parent, you know that. You know, it's, it's the worst news any parent can get. Lindsay had disappeared in a crowded and mysterious foreign culture, a world away, and the hawkers made immediate plans to go there. You've just got to find your child. Anything else in your life doesn't matter, you've just got to find them. The hawkers' fears were intensified because the family could clearly remember the nightmarish, high-profile case of Lucy Blackman, another 21-year-old British woman who vanished in Japan. Lucy's father was quick to get in touch with the hawkers. Tim Blackman has offered us lots of advice and help. He's been very helpful. He's, he's a very kind man. It's a terrible fraternity you're part of. Mm -hmm. That, And yet, the experience from another family with a similar loss can help in sometimes those dark days. Nothing can help us. like the Blackmans before them faced a personal trauma unfolding in a culture they didn't understand and in a language they didn't speak. We see echoes of what we were dealing with uh, shining through the, the Hawker investigation and, and I kept finding myself either up a blind alley or a door that wouldn't really open. It's horrifying to, to think that another family is facing what we had to face, and and in such similar circumstances. Seven years earlier, Lucy's sister and father had rushed to Japan to help find her. Their first strategy had been to get the Japanese press on their side. I spoke to her about three weeks ago. We wanted to get them interested in Lucy's case so that on primetime TV in the evening, Lucy's face would pop up and we were expecting somebody to ring in and say, oh yes, she's being kept in the flat across the way from me or whatever. But whatever their efforts, the Blackmans heard nothing. Lucy disappeared in the summer and by the time the snow fell, hope was fading. In a traumatic story that lingers to this day, the Blackmans would wait more than half a year for any answers about Lucy. For Lindsay Hawker's family, things would move much more quickly, but with a stunning similarity. Lindsay was a beautiful girl, so was Lucy Blackman. You know, they, they both had dreadful, dreadful crimes committed upon them. What happened to Lindsay and Lucy? their families find out when we come back. Lindsay Hawker had just turned 22 years old when she vanished in Tokyo while teaching English there. She loved teaching so much. She was kind, she was caring, she helped people and I don't think of whom they could have been more proud than Bill and I have been of Lindsay. We just prayed, really. We just prayed that she'd be all right. Lindsay Hawker's disappearance created a chilling sense of deja vu for another English family, that of Lucy Blackman. She vanished in Tokyo seven years earlier. It actually, it pains me to put myself back in that situation, to remember what it was like. I almost have a kind of breakdown thinking about it because it was such a hugely traumatic thing to take on. We were out looking for to bring Lucy home and have her laughing and chattering in our sitting room again. Well, I spent quite a lot of time just thinking, you know, why didn't I understand how dangerous this trip could have been? Why didn't I ever think for a moment that something might happen to Lucy? 
Lucy's parents are divorced. Her mother, Jane, made her own trips to Tokyo as the weeks without word on Lucy turned into months. I keep hoping that they'll say, oh, we found her. But realistically, seven months on, I have to think, you know, the worst. You know, I may never know what ever, ever happened to her. People say to me, oh, how many children do you have? And I think, well, do I have three or do I have two? It's just awful. What happened next for the Blackmans was more brutal than anything the family could have imagined. Eight months after she disappeared, Lucy's dismembered body was found in a cave some 30 miles from Tokyo, near the sea. Lucy's father and sister and brother went to visit the site. The Japanese press, courted and useful at the beginning of their search, had in the end become a target for the family's anger and frustration. Can you go, please? Go! Now! Go on. Go. Get out of here! Go, please. It's not some, you know, a movie. It's, it's reality. Lucy isn't different. She's not um, wealthy. She's not poor. She, she's just an ordinary person from an ordinary family with a brother and a sister and a mum and a dad. And I think what's so important for everyone to, to do is just to occasionally stop and look at their family and their friends and think how lucky they are. For eight months, Lucy's family had hoped for some miraculous outcome that would mean she was alive. For Lindsay Hawker's family, hope never even got a footing. Just the day after they heard she was missing, authorities came to the house to tell the Hawkers Lindsay's body had been found in a way that could only mean she was brutally murdered. My world stopped when I found that she died, but then my world stopped twice when I found out she'd been murdered and that she'd suffered pain. Do you remember it the same way, Lisa? Yeah, it's just awful. Awful. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. Those feelings and emotions I never want to experience ever again. Mr. Hawker. Mr. Hawker. Lindsay's father flew immediately to Japan. My daughter didn't come here to be murdered. She came here to help people. She came here to teach. He'd gone there to bring back his daughter's body. I asked him to come bring her home. <laughs> Just promised that he'd bring her home. I had to go and identify my daughter and formally identify her, which again was not good. That must be... It was dreadful. Her face was just a complete mess, but I knew it was Lindsay. And she had no hair. Her hair had been shaven off. And she had very long hair. She had hair down to here. She had beautiful, natural hair. How did my daughter die? Immediately they didn't give us the answers because the chief officer didn't know them himself. Those are hard questions to ask because you're, you're asking about the final moments of your child's life. And in this case, you know that they were awful. They were awful. We found out since that they were perhaps even more awful than I first imagined. I have to look back and look at 22 years of a beautiful daughter. I try to blank out probably the last 12 hours of her life. I try to look at everything she did for people. Lindsay was, had everything. She had friends, she had a great education. She was beautiful, she was inner beauty. And she just met evil that day. She just met the most evil thing in the world. Japanese authorities now say they have a very good idea who killed Lindsay Hawker and Lucy Blackman. As two separate cases unraveled in Tokyo, the men targeted by police shared at least one thing in common, backgrounds of wealth and power. Stay with us. Two 
families traumatized by the disappearance of their daughters in Tokyo. Now they know the awful truth. Authorities have found the mutilated bodies of Lucy Blackman and Lindsay Hawker. But for the families, that's not enough. They want answers, and they also want justice. Here again, Elizabeth Vargas. In contrast to American and British authorities, Japanese police share very little information with the victim's family. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because you're dealing with the loss of one of the most important people in your life and you feel very isolated and very afraid and um, we feel as if we're being treated as if we don't have any rights or any entitlement to any information. You go abroad and you have left behind all the sort of support mechanisms that you, you take for granted in your daily life. The hawkers are now having to find strength from within, being kept out of the investigation because it might interfere with the police investigation. We've just got to have faith in the Japanese police. The Blackman family said that they felt in dealing with the Japanese police that it was a very polite wall that they ran into. People were very polite and firm. I'm sorry we have nothing for you today. That's Thank a you very, very good much. analogy of the Japanese police. A very good analogy. We can just hope that that, that uh, wall behind it, they're doing something good. That's all we can hope. What we've said from day one is that we feel as if we have had to conduct our daughter's murder investigation. The well-guarded investigations began where each woman worked. Lindsay Hawker taught English to people of all ages at a language school. Lucy Blackman had a different job, but one that shared some potential clients, wealthy Japanese businessmen. Lucy worked in one of Tokyo's numerous hostess clubs, a popular and long accepted part of sophisticated nightlife in Japan, and a setting that became central to the mystery around her disappearance. In 2001, I worked in the club where Lucy Blackman was working. Here were places where Japanese businessmen with huge fat um, um, expenses wallets could go at the end of the day and they could basically spend the evening chatting to attractive young women and, you know, drinking Suntory whiskey at $300 a bottle. You would talk to them, you might sing karaoke with them, you would serve them drinks, you would light cigarettes, it was as simple as that. British novelist Mo Hader set a thriller in that seductively charged atmosphere and says Western women were at a premium. White Westerners were so respected that there would be huge status to having a Western woman on your arm. Lucy Blackman, like many young British, Australian and American women, thought that hostessing would be lucrative, easy and safe. The clubs are not selling sex, they're selling alcohol and the hostess's interactions with the customers, however flirtatious, are strictly limited. At one point, I think a customer tried to touch a girl on the breast and he was immediately thrown out of the club and banned for life. When Lucy Blackman vanished, police theorized that a hostess club client may have wanted more. The investigation led authorities to this seaside condominium and its owner, real estate millionaire Joe Giobara, a bachelor with a taste for expensive boats, costly cars, and, we've been told, Western women. Obara was a regular on the hostess club scene. One club manager remembers him using different names, but the same elegant style. He came maybe two or three times. He was very fashionable, wearing Versace and Armani and so forth. He was very good at English, and I saw him talking with girls very quietly. Obara was arrested in a separate rape case. Eventually, eight women would come forward to say that he had drugged them, raped them, and videotaped himself doing so. He videoed at least 50 of these occasions. And the women recall waking up the next day and being told by Georgie O'Barra, oh, you drank much too much last night. I put you to bed. I hope you don't mind. Um, here's some money because you've missed a whole day's work. 
Obara maintained the sex was always consensual, but once he was in custody on the rape charges, police began to connect him to Lucy Blackman. As police searched his properties, there were leaks about telephone records that showed Lucy had made a call from one of his mobile phones. And it turns out that Obara's seaside apartment was located some 300 yards from the cave where Lucy's body was eventually found. Authorities suspect Lucy died from an overdose of some drug he administered and that Obara panicked and hid the body. There was sufficient evidence to charge him in Lucy's death. And seven years after Lucy disappeared, there would finally be a verdict in the case against Joji Obara. Lucy's father says nothing could have kept him away from the courtroom. And I was thinking on the way over, you do lots and lots of things for your children. Uh, you go to all sorts of ghastly school events and you go and sit and watch them fall off the edge of the stage at some, you know, whatever it is, and you do all these things. And I was thinking at the time that, um, you know, I'm now going to this thing, which would be the final hearing trial of, of, of Lucy's uh, killing. Coming up, a verdict in Lucy Blackman's case and the twisted tale of yet another young woman. And he videotaped himself raping her. Yeah. As he had all the others, yeah. Hundreds, according to the police. Stay with us. Two young women, perfect strangers, have vanished in Tokyo. Lindsay Hawker was teaching English. Lucy Blackman worked in a social club that catered to wealthy men. But if only they had known about a third young woman who traveled that same road before them. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. Like parents everywhere, the Ridgeways in Claremont, Australia, hoped their children's dreams would come true. Of their two daughters, Samantha and Carita, it was the younger Carita who showed specific ambitions early in life. She loved drama and play acting. You know, the two <laughs> girls would often uh, tip up a couple of chairs and put a blanket over it and do a play, and you know, we had to watch them. And Carita was a really lovely girl, and I, I just thought that she would do really well in life. She wanted to be an actor, and she made a couple of uh, little movies and did a couple of screen tests, and uh, it's great to see her there in front of you on the screen, especially where she misses her lines and cracks up. Can I trade my car? <laughs> and that, that really typified Corita to me. Take two. In one take, Corita took the role played by Janet Lee in Hitchcock classic Psycho. Mood for trouble. What? What? If I'm gonna treat you so fair and square that you won't have one human reason to give Can me. Can I trade my car and take another? Can I trade my car and take another? In a cruel irony, Corita was fated for an early death as shocking as any in a movie thriller. When she was 21, Corita left for Tokyo to earn money for acting school. Her sister Samantha was already teaching English there, and Corita wanted to do the same. I said, just come stay with me and, you know, we'll get you a job. There was nothing open at the time. So she just took a job that was in the newspaper. You found a job as a hostess at a right, club. Right, working in a hostess club. Karita worked at a club in the Ginza, Tokyo's most expensive shopping area. It felt upscale and safe. We didn't have a lot of idea about what it was. I mean, you know, we knew that it was like talking to customers, um, serving them drinks and chatting. And we thought, that seems pretty harmless. Carita seemed to think it was just a, a laugh. It was also a job that left opportunity for sightseeing, and Carita's time in Japan was a happy one. Until the night she never came home, and the phone call that came the next day. It was the hospital calling me to tell me that Carita was in uh, the hospital suffering from food poisoning, and that I should come down straight away. When you got there, what did they say? A Japanese guy by the name of Nishida dropped her off and uh, she was unconscious or semi-conscious, couldn't speak. Samantha was told a man calling himself Nishita left Karita at the hospital after telling doctors she had a violent reaction to bad seafood. 
Samantha was also told her sister's condition was increasingly dire and that Corita's liver was failing. They were trying to guess how she had sustained you know, liver damage. But the doctors weren't saying this is foul play? Not at all. They thought it was hepatitis E, something she drank or ate while out with this fellow. The mysterious the Nishida. Right. I asked her who this Nishida guy was and I asked her what happened. She couldn't answer anything. All yeah. she did was put her hand out. She just wanted her hand held. Of all the questions Corita wasn't conscious enough to answer, the most disturbing centered on Mr. Nishita. Corita had a fiancé back in Australia. She wasn't dating and she lived with her sister, who was immediately suspicious. We didn't even know why she would have gone out with him. What were you thinking? What were you imagining? Oh, I thought he gave her drugs. I thought he did something. I didn't know what he did. When Corita's parents arrived in Japan, the family's requests for an investigation into the mysterious Mr. Nishita were, they say, ignored by both the Australian Embassy and the Tokyo Police. We were over there on our own. No embassy, no police, nothing. We were relying on the authorities to do whatever authorities do. <laughs> they weren't doing any of it. You know, and you were also back, going I through see. a trauma and grief of your own. It's oh, hard yeah. to think straight. I couldn't, and uh, it was really difficult. I, I could hardly uh, talk. Corita's condition, whatever its cause, became the overwhelming concern. She had suffered complete liver failure and was put on life support. And days later, she was brain dead. We were just so shattered. Nothing can prepare you for that. So she'll have to be on life support forever. So at that point, you made, the family made an, an excruciating decision, I'm sure, to turn off life support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were united. We decided, you know, it's, we can't keep her like that. So just turn it off and, and let her, you know, die peacefully, which it was very peaceful. Corita Ridgway was cremated on the day before her 22nd birthday, and her ashes were brought back to Australia. That was in 1992, and whatever peace the family made with it over time was shattered eight years later. The disappearance of another woman working as a hostess, Lucy Blackman, would unite their families in a devastating bond when authorities delivered some shocking news. They had discovered that the man who killed Lucy Blackman uh, also was responsible for Corita's death. The man the Ridgeways had known as the mysterious Mr. Nishita was really Joe Giobara, the same man, authorities say, who killed Lucy Blackman. Among the evidence against Obara were boxes and boxes of videotapes showing him raping both Japanese and Western women, among them an unconscious Corita Ridgeway. And there was a diary note that read, Corita Ridgeway, too much chloroform. Authorities said Corita had most likely died not from food poisoning, but from a fatal dose of chloroform administered by Obara. When I heard about it, I mean, I was, I was just sickened again, physically sick. Oh, I was so angry. I was so angry. I'm still so angry. Do you think that perhaps if the doctors in Tokyo had known when your sister came in in the terrible state that she was in, mm -hmm that she was suffering from chloroform overdose, they might have been able to have saved her life? Yes, I think so. There are antidotes to chloroform poisoning. You have to do it quickly though. Otherwise a person dies from liver and kidney failure, which is what happened to her. Exactly what happened to her. There was evidence given by two girls, those uh, girls at the club, that he had offered her a lift. And so they thought he had chloroformed her in the car and just carried her from the car to his apartment. And once he got her into the apartment, he videotaped himself raping her, yeah. as he had... All the others, yeah. Hundreds, according to the police. Right. Hundreds of others. It's a huge number, huge number. 20 years worth. It's hard to fathom. <laughs> it's unbelievable. The fact is, if police had listened to you in 1992 and investigated this man, Lucy Blackman, and. God knows who else might still be alive. Absolutely. They could have caught him then. They could have caught him then.
15 years after Corita Ridgway died, seven years after Lucy Blackman's body was found, their families would hear the verdict on the man charged with killing both their daughters. That startling conclusion and another family's beginning struggle as a second man emerges when our story continues. Three young women moved to Tokyo for work and adventure, and all three were murdered. But after years of waiting, the families of two of the women are hoping for justice. Here's Elizabeth Vargas with the conclusion of our story. The trial of Japanese real estate millionaire Joji Obara lasted for almost seven years, a length not unusual for complex cases in Japan. He'd been charged with eight rapes and the deaths of two young Western women. Lucy Blackman's dismembered body was found in a cave near Obara's home. Through the years, Lucy's father and sister attended the legal proceedings, and they were there at the end of April 2007. It really hit me that I was sitting eight foot away from the man who murdered my sister, and uh, it was very ha hard to contain that emotion. Also in the courthouse that day was the family of Corita Ridgway. Videotapes police say Obara had recorded showed him raping her while she was unconscious. Our main point of going to, for the verdict to see Obara be given his uh, I don't know, punishment and get some justice. The families of both dead young women were aware of Obara's wealth and feared its influence. You've got about six or eight lawyers of Abara, and on the other side, the one prosecutor and his assistant. And I, mm. and I thought, well, there's no way mm. we're going to get a verdict, not with all those lawyers there. Verdicts in Japan are up to a judge, not a jury. And when they came in Joji Obara's trial, they were split, leaving one family feeling they got justice and another in shock not found guilty for, for Lucy's death. The yeah. prosecution were horrified. I mean, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police, you could hear their jaws dropping on their chest when the announcement was made mm. in the court. They were devastated. The surprising verdict in the high-profile case set off speculation about the advantage of high-priced lawyers and evidence that may have left a reasonable doubt. All the evidence um against Ibarra in regards to Lucy's case was circumstantial. He bought a chainsaw, uh, a tent, the 10 plastic bags that her body parts were found in. The judge stated that because he bought those items and also a couple of other miscellaneous items, that they couldn't prove that he bought those items to dismember her, you know, because he bought an ice cream or something as well. It didn't, it didn't fit with the story. The case lacked the kind of proof Corita Ridgway's had, a handwritten note referencing drugging the victim, and a videotape of Obara raping her. He was given life for Corita's death and then the eight other girls who were raped but lived. How would you describe Joji Obara? He's a coward. He's a total coward. He won't even admit his crimes. He lies constantly. He uh, comes up with almost like a, like a religious idea that you have to commit all of your bad acts in the first half of your life and all the good ones in the second half of your life and just bizarre statements like that. You know, the, the guy's going to be in prison for life and, and that's what was always important, was a justice in that way, that he would not be out on the streets. So I think I decided quite quickly that that was going to have to be sufficient. With two different verdicts, both families will tell you they were left without what they consider the media's most insipid cliché, closure. I've never really quite understood what closure is or what closure might be. Um, I assume the sort of closure is that you sort of come to the end of it and maybe put it down and walk away. And I've never really felt that I would be able to put Lucy down and just walk away. I think when you lose a child, there is no closure. It's just a buzzword, I suppose, perhaps to make people feel more comfortable. Because there's never a day goes by that I don't think about Corita. You don't want to think that, you know, someone you love died a horrible death. 
That's, it makes it so much worse. And you never really get over it. I'm not, I'll probably never get over it. Every time it's brought up, you know, emotion wells up. It's very difficult to speak. <clears throat> it just won't go away, really. Within a month of two families getting their verdicts in Tokyo, the family of the most recent victim, Lindsay Hawker, was just beginning its ordeal. Unlike the other cases in this story, Tokyo police had an immediate suspect in Lindsay Hawker's grisly death. Again, it was a man from a well-to-do family, a 28-year-old horticultural student named Tatsuya Ichihashi. Lindsay was teaching English in Japan and Ichihashi had been obsessively pursuing her, asking for lessons, one day showing up outside her apartment. He apologized for his behavior of scaring her, frightening her, and he asked her again if she would teach him English. She thought he was not, didn't worry her, he was just a bit strange and she felt sorry for him. And she emailed back saying that she would be prepared to teach him English but only at a public place. Lindsay told friends she'd be giving Ichihashi a lesson and arranged to meet him at a coffee shop. Security cameras there capture the last day anyone saw Lindsay Hawker, and when she vanished, Ichihashi's was the first name to surface. Ichihashi. Our officers went to Ichihashi's apartment for questioning, based on information that Ms. Hawker saw Ichihashi recently. Nine police officers were sent. Ichiachi was leaving the apartment. Police officers asked, are you Tatsui Ichiachi? To which he responded he was, and he, he ran off. The police officers grabbed him, but they only grabbed his rucksack. And he was able to just dash off and melt into? I'm afraid so, yes. He caught them off guard and fled the scene. I asked them how, if there were police officers outside the flat, police officers on the fire escape and down on the ground, they'd managed to let him get away. And apparently the police officers don't carry radios, they don't radio to one another. So the police officers who were on the ground weren't aware that he'd escaped. What happened next was the bombshell in the case. Searching the apartment Ichihashi occupied, police found Lindsay Hawker's body bruised and with her head shaved. She was buried in a mixture of sand and chemicals to help decomposition in a bathtub on the balcony. He hasn't just brutally murdered her. He's left her on his balcony to rot away. And then I suppose he would just dispose of what's left eventually. He was going about his normal routine. He was going to the gymnasium, the police tell us. Ichihashi escaped into the vastness of Tokyo. Police think he may be working under a false ID, living as a street person or in disguise. And they told us finding him is a top priority. Hey, Currently, we have 140 officers, including the chief of criminal investigations, working on the case. It's so difficult when it's 12,000 miles away, just after my daughter's murder. The Japanese police said it's just a matter of time before they found this suspect. They had his passport. He had very little money. Ichiyashi comes from a very well-to-do family. His father's a brain surgeon. His mother's a dentist, I believe, yep. with no credit cards, no passport. Somebody's got to be helping him. Do you think it's his parents? I wouldn't like to comment on that. The hawkers say police read them a statement from Ichihashi's parents. We've communicated with them via the police. What did their statement say to you? That he wished to live in America and open a park in America. And that's why he needed to improve his English. And they wished their son would atone for his crime. And, and they said they it said. was regrettable. They said regrettable. It, it was regrettable. regrettable. That's an odd choice of words. That's a disgraceful think. choice of words, isn't it? They don't deny that he committed the crime. Elizabeth, there is no other suspect. So they have enough evidence 
that he is the only suspect in the murder of my daughter. Police confirm they think he's their man. When Mr. Bill Hawker came to Japan, he said Ichihashi put Japan to shame. Those words resonated in our hearts, and we remember them as we proceed with our investigation. We are determined to find the suspect for Ms. Lindsay. Lindsay's family fears the suspect could be loose anywhere in the world. The family-run website about Lindsay's case displays his picture, as do t-shirts the hawkers are distributing. They want as many eyes on this face as possible. I just wouldn't want another family to have to go through what we've been through the last six months, because it is living hell. He's out there, he's free. Who knows how many of the missing girls there are out there, right. and that's what makes this more sinister. Do you think that your family can have peace if he isn't caught? I mean... We'll never have peace, but we'll have a little bit more peace. Knowing that he's off the caught. streets. And the scary thing is, is Lindsay was probably the most sensible person I know, and had, was so wise and knowledgeable. And if it can happen to her, it can happen so easily to someone else. We wouldn't wish this on anyone, the pain that we feel every single day. Waking up and having to tell yourself your sister's been murdered. I wouldn't want that on anyone. We want to make sure that somebody pays for this crime. That our world will never be the same again. I had three beautiful daughters, and I've just got two. There was finally a little comfort for the hawkers. After a two-year manhunt, Tatsuya Ichihashi was arrested in Osaka. He had eluded authorities in part by undergoing plastic surgery. At his trial, he confessed to killing Lindsay Hawker and was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. As for the Blackman family, Japanese prosecutors later appealed Joji Obara's not guilty verdict in the death of Lucy. He was retried and found guilty in the abduction and mutilation of her body. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.